hantavirus is a virus that's a microscopic organism that has now been recognized to cause a newly described disease, the hantavirus pulmonary syndrome. Initially, people from the Southwest were showing up with it, but now it's been found all over the U.S. This doesn't mean that it's spreading. We're just able to discover it in different states now. The reason that we can find it in these different areas is that we now have tests that will identify the disease with 100% certainty, and we have alert clinicians all over the country who are looking for it. We've also discovered that it's not really a new disease. It's an old disease. By looking at samples from people who have died with unexplained lung disease, we've been able to discover this syndrome as far back as the late 1970s. So it's been here a long time. We just haven't been able to recognize it until now. There are other hantavirus diseases found throughout the world. The viruses that cause these diseases are each transmitted by a different type of rodent. But none of the other viruses are as deadly as the virus that causes hantavirus pulmonary syndrome. In fact, over 50% of the people who get it die from it. The two universal symptoms that were seen in every patient were fever and muscle aches. These are severe pains involving the large muscle groups, the thighs, the hips, the back, sometimes the shoulder. And then about half the patients have abdominal problems, nausea and vomiting and abdominal pain. Some patients will have cough and shortness of breath early on, and some may go for a week or 10 days before they get the cough and the shortness of breath. The transmission cycle begins with the rodents who carry the virus. The virus is probably released through the rodent's urine, droppings, and saliva, just like in other hantaviruses. They transmit it or pass it on to each other, but they themselves don't get sick from it. Once it's released, it doesn't live very long, maybe a few days. During that time, a person may come in contact with the virus. The main method of transmission is when the virus enters the body by breathing contaminated air. This happens when fresh urine, droppings, or contaminated nesting material are stirred up and the virus floats in the air. Tiny droplets become airborne and then can be breathed in. Another way a person might get it is through rodent bites, but this is very rare. It is suspected that a person could get it if they touched a surface contaminated with rodent excretions and then touched their nose or mouth. Usually within one to three weeks, but probably as long as six weeks, early symptoms develop. The infected person usually has a fever, headache, and severe muscle aches. And they might develop stomach problems, dizziness, or chills. About four to five days later, the lungs fill up with fluid and the patient feels short of breath. Then they get extremely ill and could possibly die. The disease stops at the person who is infected. In other words, it is not transmitted from one person to another. We trapped rodents in and around the households of individuals who had suffered from Hantavirus pulmonary syndrome and identified the deer mouse and the cotton rat as the primary species which were responsible for these infections. The deer mouse is a deceptively cute animal with big eyes and big ears. It comes in a variety of colors depending on its age, but normally it ranges from a gray to a reddish brown. It has a white underbelly and a tail which has uh, sharply demarcated white sides. The cotton rat has a larger body than the deer mouse. The fur is longer and coarser and is typically of the color of grayish brown and can even approach grayish black. The deer mouse has one of the widest geographic ranges of any rodent found in North America. The cotton rat, on the other hand, is primarily found in the eastern and southeastern United States and extends its range all the way down to the North and South America. The deer mouse is most commonly found in woodland habitats, although it can also be found in down in desert areas. The cotton rat prefers overgrown areas which are overgrown by shrubs and or tall grasses. Although both these rodents are primarily found in rural environments, if the conditions are right, you can find them in cities. It can be hard to tell one mouse from another mouse, and you cannot tell an infected mouse or rat from an uninfected mouse or rat. 
In the future, we also expect that other Honda viruses will be found associated with other rodents. So in dealing with rodents, it's best to deal with them as if they all may be infected and use suitable precautions. As with any newly recognized disease, there's been a lot of speculation about how you can get hantavirus disease. Many people have been misinformed, and widespread fears have developed. There's still a lot we don't know about this disease, but there's some things that we do know. We know that you cannot get it from uh, kissing or hugging someone who has the disease. We know that you cannot get it from doctors or nurses working with uh, patients with the disease. We know that you cannot get it from transfusion, from blood from someone who has had the disease in the past and survived it. We don't believe it's transmitted from farm animals, pets, or insects. The only way you can get it is from exposure to infected rodents, saliva, urine, droppings, or nesting material. The scariest part about the hunter virus is the fact that it doesn't seem to pick any certain age group. It's young, old, or any nationality. The ages of people who have contracted hunter virus illness has ranged from 12 to 69, and the average age has been about 30. It's affected both males and females pretty much equally. Um, interestingly, most people who have contracted the illness have been healthy and very active prior to becoming infected. Initially, the virus was identified among people living in the Southwest, and for that reason, some misinformed people believed it was only an Indian disease. But it isn't simply an Indian disease. It affects people of all races and ethnic backgrounds from all over the country. The one thing they all had in common is they came into contact with an infected rodent host, either at work or at home or through some recreational behavior. We clean out tractor cabs and combine cabs and truck cabs, uh, grain drills and planters, uh, boxes. Though those things, they all they all carry or uh, have mice nests and rat nests or whatever, whatever the case may be. Rodents uh, nests in them, and and um, if that's where I got exposed. I, I guess I'm not real sure. We don't know exactly how each specific individual has become infected because there are a variety of circumstances under which people become infected, either at work, at play, or at home. The common factor, however, appears to be contact with infected rodents. And what's clear is that the closer this contact is with infected rodents, the more likely somebody is to become ill. Obviously, somebody's greatest risk of becoming ill is if they have direct contact with infected rodents. This could occur either through cleaning out your home where there's some infected rodent nests or droppings or while trapping rodents or possibly touching these rodents. We also believe that people are at high risk if they have indirect contact with rodents. We've had a number of cases where people have become ill shortly after entering tightly enclosed spaces where rodents had recently been living. It's possible that when people enter such spaces, the rodents scurry around and actually aerosolize dust and live virus up into the air where people can breathe it. Also, if somebody is cleaning out such areas such as attics or barns or sheds or garages, uh, it's possible that they're going to start also stirring up some dust and rodent nests that will start getting up into the air. People are probably at some risk when they enter areas where rodents are out in the open. This can occur from disturbing the rodents' natural habitat through agricultural activities or outdoor activities. The most common times that people come into contact with rodents are spring and summer, when people are opening up cabins or sheds and cleaning out buildings that have been closed during the winter. I guess that the spring I got sick of 92, I. Uh, don't remember seeing any more mice than usual, but but because we were busier, I, I do remember being being exposed to more mice and, and rodent nests uh, in the cleaning of equipment. Fall is also an important time because that's when mice tend to come indoors to seek warm shelter during the winter months. Actually, the chances of your getting a hantavirus infection are very low. 
If you compare the number of infected rodents that we've seen to the number of cases, it's really an uncommon event. Occasionally, more than one person in a family will get the disease, but that's extremely rare. As a matter of fact, it's not a common disease in this country at all. We've only found about 50 Americans who have been infected in the last year. However, when you do get the disease, it's very serious. More than half the patients have died despite good medical care. I guess I remember being in the emergency room a little bit. Remember the oxygen uh, they tried to force in me was like standing behind a jet airplane. And 31, 32 days later, I woke up and the season had changed from being winter to being spring. And that was a shock to my system. At the present time, there's no specific treatment for the hantavirus infection. What we do know is that if patients are recognized early and are taken to an intensive care unit, some patients may do better with this form of treatment. When I would talk to the nurses and some of the doctors, they would say that you were lucky to get him in when you did because he wasn't under a lot of distress. You got him in right before he got the full impact, whereas a lot of the individuals who did die from the disease came in when they were under full distress and it was really hard for them to do anything for them. If you've been around rodents and have symptoms such as fever, muscle aches, and severe shortness of breath, be sure to tell your doctor about your exposure. This alerts your physician to look closely for any rodent-borne illness such as hantavirus disease. Because we have only recognized this disease since May of 1993, uh, we have a lot to learn about how the disease is caused and why it occurs in the lungs. If we can understand the nature of the disease process, then we can treat it better. CDC has developed a comprehensive strategy to allow us to effectively address the challenges posed by emerging infectious diseases. With respect to hantavirus pulmonary syndrome, it is critically important that people be aware of measures that they can take to minimize their risk of exposure to infected rodents. To prevent getting hantavirus disease, make it difficult for rodents to live where you live using these simple and getting hantavirus disease. Make it difficult for rodents to live where you live using these simple and safe precautions. To keep your home clean, wash the dishes and clean the counters. This is particularly important at night because that's when the rodents are active and out looking for food. Also, keep the floors clean and store food in rodent-proof containers. Keep a tight-fitting lid on the garbage and in the evening discard any uneaten pet food. To control rodents inside your home, use continuous trapping efforts. Set the trap near the baseboard because rodents usually run along a wall which provides them with a sense of security. If plague is a problem where you live, use flea spray prior to trapping. Seal all entry holes on the inside with steel wool or other patching materials. To prevent rodents from coming inside, it's also necessary to seal any holes on the outside. Clear brush and grass from around foundations to eliminate a possible source of nesting material. And use metal flashing around the base of the house to provide a strong metal barrier. The closer mice live to your house, the more likely they are to find a way inside. Control rodents on the outside of your house as well. Totally eradicating rodents is not really practical. But with continuous effort, you can keep the rodent population very low. The fewer rodents there are, the less likely you are to be exposed. In addition to the regular use of traps, 
poisons or odenticides may be used. But be sure to keep them out of the reach of children and pets. Encourage natural predators such as non-poisonous snakes, owls, and hawks who play a major role in controlling rodent populations in the wild. Eliminate any possible nesting sites and food sources by elevating hay, wood piles, and garbage cans. Also, locate them 100 feet or more from your house. Store all animal feed in containers with lids. When you feed your pet, put out enough food for only one day. In the evening, discard any excess food and take up water bowls. Eliminate junk and other things that provide shelter to rodents. Another important aspect of preventing hantavirus is to always use safety precautions. Wear rubber gloves when cleaning or working in areas infested with rodents. Don't stir up and breathe dust. This happens when you vacuum or sweep up droppings, urine, or nesting materials. Instead, thoroughly wet contaminated areas with a detergent or liquid that deactivates the virus. This includes most general purpose disinfectants and household detergents. Heavily wetting the area with a disinfectant prevents the virus from being stirred up into the air. For cleaning large areas, you can mix one and one half cups of bleach with one gallon of water. Once everything is wet, take up contaminated materials with a damp towel, then mop or sponge the area with disinfectant. Spray dead rodents and nesting materials with disinfectant. To dispose, place in double bags along with all cleaning materials. Then bury the bags, or burn them, or put them in the appropriate waste disposal system. If burying or burning is not feasible, contact your local or state health department about other appropriate disposal methods. Finally, disinfect your gloves with either disinfectant or soap and water. When going into cabins or outbuildings that have been closed for a while, open them up and let them air out before cleaning them. For heavy rodent infestations, seek help from professional exterminators or contact your local health authorities. These safety precautions also apply to your vacation or where you work because rodents can go anywhere. In conclusion, make it difficult for the rodents to live where you live by keeping your home clean and by controlling rodent populations on the inside as well as the outside of your home. But above all else, use safety precautions to protect yourself. And remember that your chances of getting hantavirus disease are very low, but the consequences of getting it are very serious.